Is an eyewitness the most valuable form of evidence in a crime? How difficult are circumstantial evidence cases, especially when the victim's body hasn't been located? In a case like the Suzanne Morphew case, well, we're going to be exploring these interesting questions as we look at the traditional forms of evidence used in criminal cases. Welcome to Profiling Evil. If you're new to our channel, thanks for joining. And if you're one of my university students or a longtime channel member, welcome back. And thanks for all your support. Now, folks, take a moment, hit that like and subscribe button and ring the bell so you get notified on all of our videos. Let's jump in and talk a little profiling. The criminal justice system demands a thorough examination of permissible evidence when weighing the guilt or innocence of those charged with crimes, especially violent crime. Traditionally, the courts explore several of the traditional forms of evidence, such as physical or forensic evidence, circumstantial evidence, eyewitness accounts, confessions. Well, let's examine each a little closer to understand how judges make their decisions. These traditional forms of evidence may be clearly manifested as the prosecution presents their case, or it may take an introduction of the evidence, coupled with expert testimony to bring clarity to its importance. You know, reaching back in U.S. history, it was Chief Justice John Marshall who said, the very essence of civil liberty certainly consists in the right of every individual to claim the protection of the laws whenever he receives an injury. One of the first duties of government is to afford that protection. The government of the United States has been emphatically termed a government of laws and not of men. It will certainly cease to deserve this high appellation if the law furnishes no remedy for the violation of a vested legal right. That was from a case called Marbury versus Madison back in 1803. Well, what Justice Marshall is saying is that the secret to preserving a free society is found in implementing a belief that all people, including those who enforce the law, are accountable to an orderly system that is ultimately responsible to the people. More understandably stated, the prosecution, the courts, and corrections need to function properly, and they must rely on the authority and limitation of law enforcement's power and responsibility to act justly in investigations and in the presentation of criminal cases. Now, I want to look at a ritualistic murder case I studied extensively as I attempt to talk about the forms of evidence. The case will be the case of Utah versus Ron and Dan Lafferty. The Lafferty brothers, as they came to be known, believed that they were prophets of the God they believed in. On July 24, 1984, these self-proclaimed zealots forced their way into the home of their sister-in-law, Brenda Lafferty. Two recent parolees accompanied them on the murder spree, and they provided lookout from a parked vehicle out front of the house. Once inside, the Lafferty brothers brutally beat and murdered Brenda before turning their sights on her 14-month-old child, nearly decapitating her. The crime scene had numerous forms of evidence used in the trial. There was blood and body fluids, DNA, blood spatter, and so much more. It was a horrid crime scene to look at. Crime scene technicians would recover physical and forensic evidence, and investigators sought out eyewitnesses for interview. They obtained admissions, omissions, confessions, and a lot of information surrounding the crime. Diagrams of the crime scene's location, the position of the victims, as well as other pertinent information was cataloged. These diagrams include intricate measurements of the entire scene and every piece of evidence at the scene. For any piece of evidence to be introduced into the criminal court, it had to be shown that it was legally and appropriately obtained. The, the Fourth Amendment protects against illegal collection and reasonableness serves as the overriding test of compliance. 
Well, weeks after their arrest, police released information from another piece of valuable evidence in the form of a handwritten document, a document called the removal letter. It carried a confession of sorts when Ron Lafferty penned the following, quote, for they have become obstacles in my path, and I will not allow my work to be stopped. First, thy brother's wife, Brenda, and her baby. It is my will that they should be removed in rapid succession, and that an example be made of them in order that others might see the fate of those who fight against the true saints of God. And it is my will that this matter should be taken care of as soon as possible, and I will prepare a way for my instrument to be delivered and instruction be given unto my servant. Close quote. That's from the removal document that Ron Lafferty wrote. Well, as we look at violent crime scenes like this Lafferty murder case, we can begin to identify the different forms of evidence. First, let's consider physical evidence. Physical evidence generally refers to items collected from non-living sources. Things like footprints, fibers, tire marks, or damage to doors and windows. One significant piece of physical evidence in the Lafferty case was a vacuum cord that was cut from Lafferty's knife and used to strangle Brenda. Forensic evidence is best described as the results obtained through scientific methods, such as testing the blood or DNA. Ballistic tests were bullets and bullet casings and weapons are uh, in the case, and they need to be examined for identifying characteristics. Forensic evidence is used to link things together, such as linking a weapon to a bullet that was recovered in a victim, a knife blade to a wound. Forensic evidence can also include the examination of things that you may not consider normally. Things like packing materials, handwriting, uh, photography and videography, or the manipulation of something as simple as a fingerprint. Let's look at circumstantial evidence now. Circumstantial evidence is explained by saying what it is not <laughs> rather than what it is. It is not direct evidence from a witness who saw or heard something. Circumstantial evidence is a fact that can be used to infer another fact. Something like one plus two equals three. Circumstantial evidence is usually including multiple forms of evidence. In the Lafferty case, an example might be the Lafferty removal document and the verbal threats that Brenda needed to be eliminated. Then the nonverbal threat written that she needed to be eliminated. Then the act she's murdered. Another example is the knife that was used to kill Brenda and the baby. It was found on a roadside near a neighboring town. The knife had Brenda's blood on it. It had been purchased a few days earlier by Ron Lafferty at a mall near their home, and it was carried in his boot as witnessed and testified to by one of the participants in the murder case. While no one testified how the knife was used to kill the mother and child, it was circumstantially tied to the Lafferty's. I hope these examples help you see how indirect evidence implies something occurred, but doesn't directly prove it. Now let's talk about eyewitnesses as a form of evidence. Many people believe that eyewitness accounts are the most valuable form of evidence out there. (laughs) Well, this is not the case. Eyewitness accounts can be influenced by so many things, including environment, lighting, life experiences, or our personal biases. I like to use an example from my days in the police academy. The year was 1980, and I was sitting in a classroom with other recruits in my academy class. We'd just returned from lunch, and we were sitting in a terribly dry presentation on the law. Most of us were having a hard time staying awake. Suddenly, The door flung open and a masked man entered the classroom, firing three shots toward the instructor, who fell to the ground. The entire encounter lasted less than five seconds and the intruder was gone. 
Before my classmates and I could even compose ourselves, the instructor sprang to his feet, announcing that the shooting was a simulation, only a drill. He then instructed us to write down everything we could remember about the shooting. What did the shooter look like? What kind of weapon was he firing? How many shots were fired? Well, in the end, he gathered our responses and then asked us to defend our memories. The answers he got might astound you. Of the 20 plus recruits in my class, we ended up with almost 20 different descriptions of the shooter, the weapon, and the circumstance. How on earth is that possible? Well, eyewitness accounts can be complicated by many factors, such as lighting, distance, the quality of our eyesight, life experiences, and our personal prejudices. As an example, I want you to answer this question. What color is a light blue 2018 Chevrolet four-door when it's sitting under a streetlight at 2 o'clock in the morning? (laughs) Now, as you're thinking about this, take into account that we don't know the lighting, the weather, or the environmental conditions. Now, some of you might say, well, it would be white, silver. Others may say gray. Well, it's a trick question, folks. It's still a light blue 2018 Chevrolet four-door sitting under a streetlight at 2 o'clock in the morning. It is still light blue. Now, while simplistic in nature, imagine how this piece of incorrect information, based on our interpretation, could take an investigation in the wrong direction. In the case of the Lafferty's, Eyewitnesses were co-conspirators to the crime. They were sitting in the car out front as lookouts. They would testify that the killers talked about killing Brenda and killing the baby. They watched the brothers forcibly enter the home while she tried to barricade the door. They noticed how the killers returned to the vehicle after the murders, covered in blood. Well, as we wrap up our discussion on the forms of evidence, Let's chat about confessions. Confessions are something that law enforcement officers hope for, maybe even pray for. Prosecutors certainly pray for them. And defense attorneys cringe at the very mention of. Juries love to hear about confessions because the confession can reduce the tremendous burden that's placed on a jury or a judge to determine truth. Unfortunately, though, there have been circumstances when Acquired confessions have been falsified. When a bizarre crime catches media attention, investigators have interviewed individuals who claim responsibility for the crime, even though there's no possible way they could have committed it. To those of us with stable minds, this seems unfathomable. But to a person with a mundane and perhaps uneventful life, it may give them recognition that they've desperately hoped for in their lives. In fact, according to David Zulowski and and Douglas Wicklander in the book, Practical Aspects of Interview and Interrogation, an offender will only confess based on whether the decision of telling the truth outweighs the consequence resulting from an admission. In the Lafferty case, the brothers chose not to provide any statements to police, and they didn't testify in their initial hearing or trial. It would be years later before Dan Lafferty would share the horrible details of that crime. Now, you could catch my interview with Dan Lafferty by going over to our content page at Profiling Evil, or look in the links below and I'll put it down there. As we wrap up this discussion about the forms of evidence, I want to mention the newest form of evidence that the courts are considering, and that is behavioral evidence. There are not many empirical studies into how reliable behavioral sciences are in the criminal investigation process. Proponents would say that it's extremely valuable, while some say it is not a science-based act. Well, that's correct. The FBI often touts behavioral science as a mix of art and science. What's clear to me is that tying an offender's past behaviors to current behaviors has merit. While science may not support gut impressions, 
Some things just make sense, and juries find it resonates with them when it's introduced. Analyzing an offender's behavior can help investigators focus the investigation when coupled with other forms of evidence. It shouldn't be the only thing. No case should be the only thing. It should be a combination of all of the forms of evidence whenever possible. Behavioral assessments can help prosecutors determine the type of expert witnesses they need to appropriately present the case. Uh, Introducing behavior as another form of evidence, when evaluated with and against the other traditional forms of evidence, can only help the investigation and the prosecution. Well, I hope this segment helps you better understand the forms of evidence and what differentiates each. It should help you better understand what's important in the crimes that you're exploring, and hopefully it'll help you as you evaluate this and other segments discussed in the Profiling Evil Academy. If you like the video, click the link over to subscribe and ring the bell so that you get informative videos like this one whenever we release them. And remember, Profiling Evil can be found at YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, And you can go to our website at profilingevil.com. And folks, if you're into podcasts, you can find us on your favorite podcast platform. So thanks for supporting us and thanks for listening. We'll see you soon at the next crime scene.